Hey guys, welcome back to Friends and Enemas season three. Pretty excited for this. It's been a long time coming, so sorry for the wait, but if you didn't know, we have moved. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see that we're in a house. Yeah, a lot of changes. Me, we, as in me and my husband and our two dogs, uh, we moved out of the RV into a house in Arizona because we've always been curious about Arizona, but we needed to make sure that we could withstand the heat. Um, yeah. yeah, we're uh, in Scottsdale. Uh, we're going to try, you know, everybody says like Arizona is beautiful. They love it. The only major downside is the summer heat. Right. So we're getting here just before the summer heat on purpose. On purpose. Uh, we're going to live through a summer and see if it's as bad as everybody says. Right. Uh, I guess if if we can't handle it, we move on to Denver. If we <laughs> or can, Utah, this is like... the, uh, if we can, then this is kind of our top choice. Currently. Yeah. So that's why we're here. That's why it's taken me so long. And we've also kind of been revamping, trying to brainstorm ways to make the podcast better. And it kind of dawned on me that I wanted depth to this podcast, and I got a little. It, it's hard, honestly. Starting a podcast for me was very difficult. It's way out of my element. It's out of my I don't know, out of my scope. Yeah, it's it's hard because you if you're gonna anybody these days can spin up a podcast, but you you need to have like something to say, yeah, and a unique angle to to differentiate yourself. Yeah, so that's what's been difficult. And I know it's a lot of healthcare workers I'm interviewing, which is on purpose. But I decided this season we're gonna do it a little different, and you guys can tell me if you like it or if you want me to go back. But this season, it's more so focused on healthcare workers, but we're humans at the end of the day, humans first, healthcare workers, second, third, fourth, whatever. But we are humans at the end of the day. And I want to know what makes us who we are, what happened in our life, good, sad, bad, anything that made you want to be better, that made you resilient, that made you come out on top, what made you grow? I want to know that stuff. And I feel like it's more relatable that way. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it. All of those things in your past, you know, whatever got you here, directly informs what type of nurse you are. Yeah. Or what type of healthcare, healthcare worker you are. Worker. What type of human you are. Yeah. So we're going to be doing a lot of. Uh, it'll be mostly healthcare workers, but it's going to be through the lens of uh, being a human first. Yeah. What What brought you here? Um, how does that affect or inform your healthcare or your practice? I think it's more of like a humans of healthcare. That's kind of the vibe I'm going for, yeah. which I got from the Hoka ad I did, which is humans of Hoka. And I thought that was really cute. I was like, damn, I could use that into my podcast and kind of like a soft white underbelly. If you guys watch him on YouTube, I love his stuff. Just kind of di deep diving into people and why they are the way they are. So that's what we're going to be doing this season. I hope you like it. If you don't, let me know. But I want some critiquing and some criticism. I want to hear it so that uh, we can constantly make it better. Yeah. yeah but for, for this episode, we're going to start off strong and Jared's going to interview me. Yeah, we. Uh, I think this is one that we've needed for a while. Like, uh, you know, Lindsay's been doing social media and doing the podcast and everything like that. But I, there's not really a, a, a place you can go if you want to meet Lindsay and you want to know Lindsay better. Um, you know, you see all of her characters on, on social media and stuff like that. Um, but I, I kind of wanted this to be just, uh, an evergreen, like compendium of who you are. Yeah. You know, I like that. All right. So start us off. Yeah. So just for starters, just tell us, tell us who you are, who, who is Lindsay open-ended on purpose. Okay. Open and on purpose. My name's Lindsay. I am 31 years old. <laughs> I almost don't know how to answer this. Um, I'm a nurse. I'm an ICU nurse. I've been a nurse for five years now. Still a baby, I feel like. Um, I've been traveling for four years. And um, I'm six six foot tall. <laughs> yeah. What else that, do you that, want to know? That seems to be an important marker for people. Yeah. Um, I feel like I am an advocate for mental health. Uh, mostly because of my own mental health that I've had to learn along the way. I love animals, sometimes more than people, and that's really me in a nutshell. Yeah, very um, something that doesn't come up as much is because we've been moving around. You're you're very 
uh, passionate about dog rescue. Yes, I am very passionate about animal rescue. Uh, back in Oklahoma, that's where I'm from. Um, I helped a pretty major dog rescue in our state. Sky took paws and claws, um, or spay car. And, um, really dove into my love for animals. I started out in college wanting to be a veterinarian, went the whole pre, um, pre-vet route, animal science major, and was working for a vet at the time. I was a kennel tech. And I just saw so much sadness with these animals who had absolutely no voice or choice that it really pissed me off. And I thought, if I continue down this route, I'm going to end up in jail. And so I had to change. I had to change what I was doing. I talked to several vets, um, shadowed them. They told me, you know, and I'm not trying to scare anyone that wants to be a vet, but they told me not to. And Um, I already had the doubt in my head that I didn't want to, um, for several other reasons, but, uh, they told me all of them were still in debt. Some of them were well into their sixties. One of them was probably almost 70 years old and told me she was still in debt. And that scared me because I grew up in a family that struggled with money and I didn't want that for my own self. So I was like, well, dang, no one ever talks about that. I don't want to be a vet. What am I going to do? Bounced majors from pre-vet, almost four years of pre-vet, to geology, which I've spoke about this before on the podcast. So if you've listened to that episode, geology to dental hygiene to taking a break because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, Besides that, I wanted to be a model, maybe an actress. I really loved uh, the entertainment space. I had been modeling since I was 14 years old. And so that was always my plan A, but I needed a plan B of how can I get there without struggling and being a waitress the whole time. There was just a lot of like, my hand was in several different pots, like what of what I wanted to do. Trying to find your place. Trying to find my place. Okay, yeah. well, that was... Uh... That was that was way. That's the podcast, guys. That was way more. That got away from me. All right, uh, it's we, time to head out. <laughs> yeah, and here we are at present day. Um, yeah. So, so that kind of gives us an idea of who you are, and uh, I, I think a thread that runs through your life, and we'll learn this as we as we kind of go through this podcast is uh, advocacy for the voiceless. Yeah, uh, you know, that's big for you. It is big for me. Something um, I pride myself in. Yeah, and let's so let's start. I guess at the start, what what was your childhood like? If if you had to describe your childhood, mm. I had a roof over my head. I had food. I had clothes. I had everything that I needed to survive, except emotionally. I would say, I was raised in a very very religious household, and. I guess looking back, I noticed that it was for an image. My household wanted to look like a certain image of perfection, of nothing's wrong in this house type thing. Um, But there was a lot of abuse, a lot of neglect, um, and a lot of it was, all of it was swept under the rug um, throughout my whole life until I was married to you. when I was in second grade, my dad, who was my dad at the time, uh, had a motorcycle accident, and that really changed the trajectory of my childhood. Um, I woke up one morning, uh, like, going through all my techniques to not cry. <laughs> I woke up one morning um, to get ready for school, and my grandma was there. I thought that was strange. I was like, that's weird. Why is she here? She was there to help me get ready for school. I knew even at eight years old, I was like, "Mm, where's my mom? And she said, your mom's at Walmart. She had to get go go grocery shopping. I said, you're lying, but okay, whatever. At 8 a.m. Yeah, at at 8 a.m. But I got a phone call from my mom later explaining to me that my dad had had a motorcycle accident. He was in critical condition in the ICU. Um, He didn't wear a helmet on his way to church and someone ran a stop sign or a red light and hit him. And he literally flew 30 feet from his motorcycle and landed directly on his head. So I would say that is the moment that everything changed for my childhood. And and just for a little bit of context, your uh, biological father, not really in the picture. True. Um, this was a stepfather that came along, but... Adopted me when I, before I was two. Adopted you. It's uh, You carry his last name. Yes. Sorry, this is a lot. It's like hard to even pinpoint where to even start because yes, you're right. The family uh, bush. But the, the family bush. It's not a tree. <laughs> yeah. um, 
my biological father is an addict, a drug addict, um, and he was very abusive to my mom physically, mentally, financially, emotionally, emotionally, all the ways. And um, he was awful. He was an awful person, um, mostly because he was an addict, but probably a little bit at baseline too. And my mom ended up finally leaving him. She was in a domestic violent relationship, um, ended up leaving him. He signed over his rights to me so that he did not have to pay child support and could live on his merry way being a drug addict. Um, so soon after that, before I was two years old, she married her next husband who, um, adopted me. So I got his last name. That is who had the motorcycle accident. That's who I grew up knowing as my dad. Um, he had his motorcycle accident. He was in and out of the hospital for months. I used to think it was years because that's what it felt like when I was a kid, but apparently it was just months. Um, and when he came home, he was extremely physically abusive along with. Take your time. along with mentally abusive um, to me and only me. Before his accident, sorry. You're good. Before his accident, um, him and my mom had my little sister. Um, so that was his full kid and Mind you, growing up, I didn't know that he was not my dad. Um, I thought that, you know, that was my dad, just like my sister's dad, up until he came home from the hospital and would tell me things like, you're not my kid. You're not my kid, you know? And I was like, what the heck? I'm like eight to 10 years old at the time. I'm like, what? Why does he keep saying this? It's so weird. Um, but it got worse and worse. Um, the verbal abuse turned into physical again, only with me. And my mom eventually had to leave him. Um, and you were, you were saying before, um, from what I understand before the wreck, he was stern, but still fair and loving yes. after the wreck. Um, he, he had a TBI yes. and, and that's a, when things started to go downhill and a frontal lobe injury. So his whole personality changed. Um, I'm sure, I don't know if he was abusive to my mom as well. Um, but he was definitely different with her for sure. I think she felt very much as a caregiver instead of a wife. Mm -hmm. My mom had to go back to work, um, which was very difficult for her too because she had been a stay-at-home mom for quite some time. She had to trust leaving him alone with me and my sister. Um, she would get phone calls from neighbors <laughs> from us screaming or you know, running out the door to the neighbor's house or all kinds of things. So my mom had some really tough decisions um, early on. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there was a lot of, uh, you know, police called on multiple occasions mm -hmm. um, and you guys didn't have a lot of options. I think your, your mom, you, there wasn't enough money to, for a, a babysitter or anything like that. So right. I started using neighbors and, and, um, and me, I started babysitting at eight years old. Yeah. I remember second grade. Sometimes she would take him to his own parents' house for them to babysit him so that I could babysit my little sister. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole, you know, his his parents also were very mean to me. So she didn't trust them with me. Um, but yeah, I watched my little sister a lot from a very young age. And all in all, he was extremely abusive. She had to divorce him eventually. And um, she was a single mom for quite some time, doing her best. Um, pulled us out of a private school that we went to, started going to public school at sixth or seventh grade. And um, when she met my now stepdad, who um, she married when I was in ninth grade, who also wasn't the best. Um, you know, and I, I, I know everyone has their own demons per se or their own issues mm -hmm. from their own childhood, but unfortunately it transferred over with it, um <laughs> You're doing fine. with their kids too. Mm -hmm. So what was the question? <laughs> oh well we're we're going through it, isn't it? Yeah. About your childhood. Just about my childhood. So 
after um, who I knew as my dad, which she divorced, um, I honestly never saw him again. After she divorced him, I stopped seeing him completely. Mm -hmm. um, he still sees my little sister, who is his daughter. Um, but my mom remarried, and unfortunately, that also had quite a lot of abuse in it. More, more verbal, I would say, but still some physical abuse. Lots of pitting kids against each other. You know, I had step siblings. I have step siblings as well. So lots of putting us against each other or against one parent or throwing dishes. Um, I never had friends over growing up. The two times I did, an altercation happened between my parents that absolutely embarrassed the shit out of me. So I never had friends over. I always went over to their their house. Um, there were several times I quote unquote, ran away, but went to stay with my best friend and her family um, because my house was just chaos. The best way to put it as it was chaos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I think one thing that I've always noticed about you and, and what I assume comes from your childhood is uh, a great deal of resiliency. Um, I think you're able to meet adversity and even if it takes some time, you're, you're able to uh, overcome difficult things. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I can see some things that um, have defined you from your childhood. But is there any, is there any defining moment that set you on this path of advocacy um, that bled into healthcare? Mm. That, you know, that ultimately informed your adult life. Yeah, that's a really good question because I want to say. I don't know if I can pinpoint an exact moment, but I remember several things growing up feeling like my mom didn't stand up for me. So I felt like I had to stand up for myself as a child. And then that being twisted into, you know, you're not, you're not sweet anymore. What happened? But really it's a kid having to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, that partnered with, um, Growing up with animals who weren't treated right, looking back on things like that and realizing when I could make a difference with animals. Um, there, I don't know if there's one particular moment, but it's a lot of little moments. Um, yeah. I remember one of the biggest decisions I made in my life was not marrying my ex. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. <laughs> I dated um, a boy that also had a pretty tragic childhood and so unfortunately we were we were not good for each other but we dated all through school pretty much on and off and he was also abusive <laughs> um I don't I don't blame him completely because again he was also raised in a pretty chaotic household mm -hmm. but I remember us um I had moved out of my parents house one summer after a another altercation with my parents um I had a loogie a loogie spit in my face and that was kind of the last straw for me that nothing was happening and uh, I was like you know what why do I keep putting myself in this house that's not any good for me I'm gonna go move in with my boyfriend and that's what I did until he told me I had to get rid of my dog which was my lifeline at the time uh, my childhood dog and I remember sitting there like how on earth can someone who loves me and know how much I love an animal <laughs> or like this dog that's been in my life this whole time tell me to get rid of him and that he'll stay with me if he gets rid of if I get rid of him mm. and I was like what the fuck am I doing why on earth am I going to marry we had already looked at engagement rings I had picked out a couple that I liked and I remember looking at rings in there with him I'm like 19 years old by the way <laughs> mm -hmm. and thinking I can't marry him yeah, it all kind of snaps into focus. It snapped immediately. I said, I'm going to end up like my mom. And my mom's a great woman, but she has a lot of issues because of things that have happened to her. Therapy would be very good for her. <laughs> but I knew, I, I was like, I'm going to end up like my mom, like my sister, like my aunt, like my grandma, like every woman in my family. I'm going to end up like them. Mm -hmm. If I marry this guy, I'm going to end up with kids in a divorce eventually because this is toxic mm -hmm. and I remember literally that moment with him telling me I had to get rid of my dog I was like I'm not getting rid of him so I have to leave this this guy like for real I have to leave him this time yeah. I stayed in my car two nights I went to stay with my brother 
um, a family took me in who I stayed with them for quite some time. And I eventually got away from him. But I, uh, I think that maybe that was the moment that I was like, no, I can't go down this cycle. Mm-hmm. I can't do what every woman in my family has done yeah. just because someone's kind of accepting me, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And I think you came to learn later in life, um, I think through therapy that the chance your, your childhood dog, uh, represented a lot more than just being a dog. He was, he was kind of the physical representation of the childhood you didn't get. And so I, I think that that was maybe a, a big reason why you were so protective of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. He was, um, I got him when I was 10 for my 10th birthday after my dad's motorcycle accident after a lot of abuse i'd always wanted a dog mm-hmm. and my mom finally let me get him and he was the best thing of me of my childhood so yeah mm. yeah chance he was og he, he was OG. passed away at 16. yeah he was yeah, a, just a few years ago the best dog yeah so um through your childhood you know it, it obviously a very difficult childhood, um, lots of low moments, but, you know, looking at you today, you've turned out to be a very strong, kind woman where, you know, a lot of times people don't go that way. Who did you meet or who helped you along the way? Who were the mentors or the, the, um, soft places to land, you know, who, who got you through all that? One of my, I would say mentors was Mrs. Roulette. She was my 11th grade, um, one of my high school teachers. And she's now a school counselor, which makes so much sense because I'm like, oh, she literally counseled so many of us kids. Like, she was just the best. But I remember going to her after some rumors were spread about me in school. And I was like, I was depressed looking back. Um, but she noticed it, pulled me out of class one day and <laughs> just reminded me of how much potential I have. and that this will be like a blip in my lifetime mm. at some point. <laughs> it's hard to hear that in high school though. It doesn't feel oh, like a so blip. It's so hard to hear it because it, everything is so real. Yeah. But I trusted her. She was one of the only teachers that really got to know me or her students. I know she did it for so many people, but she really impacted me. I would say her, even, even my mom, my mom yeah. really wasn't, She was doing the best with what she had. Um, And she always reminded me that you don't want to end up like me. You know, she wanted the better for me, even if she couldn't do some things I think she should have done Mm -hmm. at the time. She did want better for me. And that did stick with me. I remember thinking when I was looking at rings with my ex, my mom literally told me not to do this. (laughs) You know, like, don't do it. You're going to end up like me. Like, I can't save you you are making this decision this will be your decision so i would say my mom even to an extent um but i want to say that's probably it (laughs) yeah i think you're uh you know your mom i think that's where you get your very strong sense of right and wrong Mm -hmm. um and backbone because she's yeah yeah she'll lay it down when she needs to yeah (laughs) okay so this is a common question but there's always uh you know it always has good insight from it yeah um if you could say anything to your 18 year old self Mm. right now knowing everything that you know what would your message to them be kind of what we said earlier like your life anything happening in your life especially when it's sad or bad feels like it's never going to get better but it can it does Mm -hmm. it it definitely can um it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be the one doing all the work. Um, what's that quote about like your trauma wasn't your fault, but it's your responsibility to change or to break the cycle or to get out of it. It's, it's that, um, you know, when I was 18, I was struggling really bad mentally looking back. I'm like, damn, nobody realized how depressed I was, but I was, um, when I was 17, I was, thinking about committing suicide for many reasons. Um, 
called a suicide hotline. Literally think like looking back to that moment, 17, 18 years old, thinking it was better to end my life than hope that there was something better in a few years. It makes me so sad because there's so many kids out there that think the same. Um, But I guess my message would be keep going. You belong here. Um, you, you deserve a space. You deserve a space on this earth. Like you deserve to be here and whatever you're going through, it can get better. Yeah. And I I think that's, um, why so much of your platform is dedicated to new grads and people being bullied, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the people who don't have as much of a voice and and you want to tell them, like, I know it feels like you can't do this and you want to quit right now, but just stick with it. You know, you'll, yeah. you will get there. Yeah. And like how much of a backbone I've grown over time with all different types of bullies, you know, my own family, I don't put up with it anymore. My, my coworkers, I don't put up with it. Watching them bully someone else. I will not put up with it. It is just such a, an ugly way to live your life, mm-hmm. to bully someone else in any way, shape or form. It's, it's just, diabolical that's my word this week yeah it's not okay and i think we're just kind of starting to see um with you know new news media coverage and and everything like that we're starting to see just how horribly destructive bullying can be absolutely and and things that you know you didn't and and most people don't figure this out till they go to therapy things that happened when you were 11 12 13 that seemed like just life at the time but informed your view of yourself as an adult mm-hmm. and still continue to hold you held yourself back 20 years later right i mean i feel like i'm a great example of that i didn't even know i was struggling mentally until my mid-20s when after we were married and i was hitting another low of suicidal ideation and just just A really bad low <laughs> but you were there for me and you wanted me to get help versus telling me and nothing is wrong with religion if that is something you believe in but I have a lot of religious trauma we could go through stories after stories with it and I do not appreciate being told don't just pray about it that did not help me all growing up mm-hmm. um, I needed someone to take me to a professional that would never happened. I needed someone to let me know it's okay to feel low. It's okay to have these highs and lows, like that's life, but there are tools that you can use to help you if you're feeling like you're at your rock bottom. Yeah. No, that wasn't there for me. So yeah, I mean, you, I think you responded better to it. Just saying like, it's, it's harder to wait on a supernatural intervention. Yeah you know, and just kind of throw your prayers out there and just hope that, that this feeling goes away. Right. But it feels more active, you know, to go to a therapist that's backed with, uh, you know, evidence-based practice Mm -hmm. and they can show you, you know, this and this and this happened in your childhood and it directly translates to this and this and this behavior as an adult. Right. Uh, And I think once you saw all that laid out, that was really important. And I, and I think it coincided with a time that, um, you know, your whole life you've kind of had, you've been in situations where you didn't have enough free space. You were constantly in fight or flight. Um, and you, you can't think when you're in fight or flight, you know, it's just everything is focused on survival. Mm -hmm. Um, I think once, you know, we, we got out and away and because I I mean, I, I didn't do anything, but give you space and safety and you did it yourself. Autonomy. (laughs) Yeah. You, you wanted, you wanted more than anything to change. You just had always, you'd never been in a space where you had an opportunity to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's been, that's been uh, really something to see. Thank you. I also think on top of that, um, never feeling enough for my parents or for anyone that, that acted as a parent to me, always feeling like I was chasing being better for them. Mm -hmm. And then realizing like I never loved myself at the time. I don't know if that makes sense. Like trying to validate myself for someone else was never working out until Mm -hmm. I started trying to validate myself for me. When I started having confidence in myself of, I am a good person. I'm doing the right thing for me. If that bothers parent figures, 
that's not on me anymore that i am an adult yeah i do make my own decisions it's okay if we think differently mm -hmm. um but all in all i didn't have a lot of like i don't even know what that would be called but i didn't have a lot of like structure and in, in being confident in who i am as a child yeah. And I think that really affected me up until I was married to luckily to you. Like I think back all the time, oh my God, if I would have married my ex, I would still be struggling mentally, mm. probably. Because um there's just no there was there's just like vast differences with like the people you put yourself around and if you settle in a relationship, like your life could just be so much different. Yeah, I mean your your support system is huge and yeah. um if you don't have a foundation to build off of uh, it's hard to you know get very high in this right i guess maslow's you know we, yeah. we're all nurses here so maslow's hierarchy you know, it's hard to get very far up in it yeah um i hear this question asked in some podcasts but if you could have a billboard in say times square or some some very busy place tons of foot traffic and it can say anything you want what what would be what's your message to the world i don't know i think I always like to think that there isn't a stigma against mental health, but then I get DMs all the time of people struggling with their family, their friends, their whoever, their spouse, of them validating their mental health or validating their feelings. And so I, I do think it would just, at the end of the day, be something about how you belong. Like, I am so saddened that there are so many people that think that think that they don't have a place on this earth or a reason or a purpose. Mm -hmm. And that just like breaks my heart because I used to be that person, but I have a purpose and I know that now. And if I just feel like if someone would have told me, you know, you belong, you, you deserve to take up space. You deserve to be here. I feel like that would have just moved me. So mm -hmm. that might be the cheesiest thing ever, but something about, you know, you belong, stay another day. You deserve to be here. You deserve to take up space. Yeah. Something like that. And I I think it's probably um, pretty apparent by by the way that we're talking and some of the things that you're saying, but uh, how big of a role did therapy play in your life? Oh, my God. it It's probably the one, one of the main things that changed me forever, mm -hmm. forever changed me. I think with a different I see things in a different lens now when some people are struggling I always wonder well what was their background or or if people have shit takes on things or they react poorly because if you knew me five years ago I reacted very poorly to things I didn't like or if someone made me angry I would throw things and act like a freaking animal but I give people a little bit more grace now too because I realize like everyone is struggling with something um Therapy really just, it gave me a new foundation of what to live off of. It gave me um, insight on things that I just could never, like, connect the dots to when I was younger. You know, why people treated me a certain way, why people didn't stand up for me, why this, why that. It really gave me, like, a, a good foundation and, like, um, just just a way to understand myself and then, in turn, understand others. Yeah, I think a lot of times whenever you're um, in those types of situations, you're you're always on the defensive. So, of course, you feel like you're backed into a corner. Of course, you feel like everybody's out to get you. Mm -hmm. And I, I think once you started therapy, you started to realize that, you know, in life, most people have good intentions and it's a lot of people trying their best and mostly failing. Yeah. And so whenever somebody wrongs you or, or uh, does something you don't like, it, a lot of times it has nothing to do with you. Yeah. Um, it's their, it's their own personal stuff that they have going on, their own personal failures, their own personal struggles. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's kind of their, their individual human. And I think that's something that gave you a lot of peace with, uh, parental figures in your life too. Mm -hmm. I really, I agree with that too. I used to struggle really bad with, um, you know, my biological dad is an, is a drug addict and why could he pick that and not me? Why, you know, why drugs over literally anything else? And it, I've talked about this before about how it made me resent 
drug addicts. I didn't understand it. This is as a child, by the way, but I didn't understand it. I didn't understand how anyone could ever do anything like that and, you know, give up actual people in their life for a substance. Mm -hmm. But obviously I've gone through school and like I, I actually, ironically enough, a lot of my patients are drug addicts and I have a lot more um, sympathy for them as well. Mm. Um, I was going somewhere, but per usual, I lost it. <laughs> yeah, this is a heavy stuff. <laughs> um, well, we, we can go a, a little bit lighter. Um, just some basic stuff. Well, what, what do you, what are your hobbies these days? What do you like to do? I like reading actually. Yeah. If, you picked a, in the last, like, I don't know, maybe three years you, you read so much. Now. I do. I was never a kid that read like in high school. I was like, if someone's reading, I was like, oh, that's so lame. Um, which is so funny, but I love reading. Like it, it helps me escape. I get to, you know, be transported to a, a freaking fantasy world with vampires doing things. And I just, I like reading, not just that, but I love reading. Reading is one of my hobbies. I would say hanging out with my dogs. <laughs> I love my dogs so much. They're literally my children. Mm -hmm. I love doing new things with them. I love seeing them experience like life. And that sounds so crazy saying out of my mouth, but it's one of my favorite things. Um, um, I like, I like being active too. Anything outdoors. I really love, mm -hmm. um, I loved trying surfing, um, uh, snowboarding. I'm not very good at either of them, but they're really fun sports. So I love being active as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got, you got really into surfing. We're a little bit landlocked. Yeah. We're landlocked, but landlocked. I do love it. Oh my God. If I lived like when we were in San Diego, I was going like every single morning. I, I love, it was just so something about the ocean is so calming and therapeutic mm -hmm. in itself along being along with me being like actually scared of the ocean i don't know how but it was so therapeutic to just be sitting in it and i'm like damn yeah i'm here yeah oh i remember what i was gonna say sorry this is gonna be backtracking a little bit but um i i think the progression of your mental health just from my eyes uh you know having watched m most of the process go down it seemed like uh you you started on meds and meds got your head above water mm -hmm. where you could breathe a little bit. And that's when you started, once you got the meds dialed in, you started therapy. Mm -hmm. And I think over the course, maybe a year or two of therapy, um, you titrated off your medications and you've been off of them a couple of years now? No, uh, sort of. So three and a half years I was on meds. Um, I had tried medications in the past as well. Um, in my like early college days, I tried medications. I tried, I don't need to name them cause they're different for everyone, but I tried two that, that didn't work for me. And so I was pr honestly pretty scared of them. I went through nursing school. I was like, oh, like still kind of scared of them, be mostly because of how I was raised as well. Um, if anyone in my family was on medications for their mental health, it was literally whispered about as if they were crazy. And so I was very scared to even try that. But when I needed help the most, I literally went to my doctor, told them what was going on. He diagnosed me with chronic depression and was like, you need to be on an antidepressant. Um, I got on my antidepressant, was on it for yeah three and a half years, but about a, like 10 months into it is when I started therapy. Um, she gave me several tools. And over time she was like, you know, I think that you have tools in your toolbox now to, if you want, to titrate off your meds because with meds sometimes come side effects. There were some side effects I was not liking, but overall it kept me alive. So it was a great tool at the time. Um, I tried going off of them once it was a disaster. I started, uh, having like out of body experiences at work. It was very dangerous. So I was like, Whoa, I got to go home. First and foremost, I can't take care of people like this. And also, can't go off my meds. I was very scared. I was like, damn it, I can't get off my meds. So we had to titrate over like six months. I think we titrated in December of 2022 is when I got off meds because December, 2023 was a year off of meds. So I'm a year and almost a year and a half off meds now. Um, I won't lie. There are days that I wonder if I should go back on them because I do still have lows. I'm still chronically depressed just off of medications, but I have therapy and I have all my tools in my toolbox and 
no fear in being on meds or having to go back on them. I, it's nothing like that. I, I don't care if I have to be on medications to live. Um, but I liked that my therapist has given me multiple um, sources and things to do besides going right back to meds. Mm -hmm. um, journaling, you'd be surprised what writing a letter and burning it or trashing it will do. It does so much for my mental health. If there's anyone that's pissed me off, I'm going to go write them a freaking letter and how much, how much they hurt me. And then I'm going to go burn it because what's the benefit of telling them all that. Mm. Um, but there's all kinds of things talking to a therapist and I know therapy is not available for everyone. It's really unfortunate. It's expensive even for us. Um, but we've made it into our budget because it's something that really, really, really changed everything for me. And finding a therapist is like dating, unfortunately. The first few I tried, I was like, what the hell? I don't want to tell my whole life to this person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I found a really good therapist, and she's um, she's amazing. She really, really helped me. Oh. Uh, okay, so going further, I guess, into um, social media, what, what you know, most people listening are going to know you for. Yeah. Uh, what made you start that? Why? Why? post your life on the internet why do any of this you know a, a short answer would be i've always loved the internet i was raised with dial-up internet um but i was chronically online even as a kid um i had a zanga i had a myspace i had a facebook you know i had all the things um and i loved it i used to used to code my own myspace if you know you know um and I really loved it. I loved watching other people online. And I think what started my journey was actually my mental health. Um, a lot of people might go to my Scrub Hacks account and think, oh, she just she just popped up one day and, and it took off. No, I've been chronically online for over a decade. I had a personal lifestyle account that quote unquote didn't take off, you know, how I was hoping it would and a fitness account. And then I was like, you know what, let's try nursing. I want to try that. And that one happened to do really good. So it gave me a voice. It gave me an um, out, an outlet, mm -hmm. like a way to, you know, a lot of my stuff is skits. I would get very angry at work about stuff, but at the end of the day, it would make me laugh. Things that we deal with that normal people do not deal with at work, you know, like your friend might FaceTime you and they work at an office job and like their boss yelled at them. But like we literally had a urine, a urinal full of piss thrown at our face and we have to go home and laugh about it because we still have to come back to work. Um, that's really where I was like, you know what? This is a great outlet. And then um, when I first started that, that's when I was actually starting my um, my own mental health journey. And I got really inspired by someone named Jax Thor Thornton. Um, she's, I believe, an Australian girl, but she's told her whole life story. She had a lot of childhood trauma as well with suicide and all types of things. And she's resilient she's the definition of resilient and she really inspired me. I was like, wow, she's talking about her mental health so freely as if no one's judging her mm -hmm. and I'm not judging her. I'm watching her and being, I'm in awe of her. That's what I wanted to do for other people. I, I wanted other people to realize like how they're not alone. Mm -hmm. Like anything that you think I'm the only person going through this, it's crazy how many other people are going through the exact same thing. With my nursing skits, um, one of the main comments I get is, I thought I was the only one, even in that, you know? Mm -hmm. I thought I was the only one that got a urinal full of piss thrown at me. No, no girl, it happens to all of us. Um, and then even deeper in that, your mental health. But then being a healthcare worker with mental health, like there's a whole nother stigma on that, which is crazy. We're human beings at the end of the day. We're allowed to have mental health issues just as our patients are. So I just, it's a, it's a great way to connect with people and just let them feel less alone. Because I think isolation is one of the most awful things that can happen to any person. And it's what can lead you down a path of, um, you know, uh, feeling like you don't belong. Yeah, I think there's a lot. I don't think I know there's a lot of stigma around speaking out about mental health. Mm -hmm. um, I think millennials are getting the ball rolling. And I think Gen Z is going to completely destroy Hell the stigma. Yeah. I, I'm excited for them. Um, but it, it, and it's so odd. Like, I don't know why if you, if you twisted your ankle, you wouldn't feel weird telling somebody I twist, I, I'm limping. I twisted my ankle. Right. You know, it, it was the, but if you're struggling with your mental health, you're supposed to like, just, uh, hold it to yourself just and you're supposed to just ball suffer, up. suffer in silence. Um, so it, it's, yeah, it's really odd. And you've got a lot of 
not backlash, but sometimes like people concerned and they're like, Hey, do you really want to be talking about this stuff on the internet? Like mm -hmm. this is, you're really opening yourself up here. Mm -hmm. uh, just talking about your mental health struggles. And so it's there. Yeah. There's a weird uh, like dichotomy between the two. And um, I think that's kind of going away. You know, it, it's, it's exciting to hear people talk openly. Oh yeah. You know, my, my therapist uh, just last week told me this and this and this. And so I'm working on it now. Yeah. Um, I, I think people should be excited about that. That shouldn't ever be a, a red flag or any uh, point of concern. Right. I mean, and if there's anyone out there wanting to post online, whether it be about your mental health or whatever, the, it's crazy. The people closest to you will be the first to tell you don't do it. I had several friends reach out to me be like, you know, you don't need to post your whole life online. Not everyone needs to know everything. What's crazy is you guys don't know everything. Like you don't. But because of what I'm posting makes them a little uncomfortable. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't need to know that. People well, squirm. People it's, squirm. Yeah. And maybe you don't need to know that. But the amount of DMs, and you've seen them, mm -hmm. the amount of DMs and comments I get saying, I thought I was alone. I thought I was the only one. That is, I feel like that's just like my my path in life is to make people feel less alone in everything in your mental health as a new grad. That's why I started a, you're not dumb. You're just overwhelmed because in anything in life, when you're in fight or flight, um, you're literally thinking about survival and that, that can go with anything in school, especially in nursing school. And then when you're a new grad, when there's a bully on the unit, making you feel stupid and inadequate and inferior, you're not going to learn. Mm -hmm. So like that, all these things like matter all throughout life. And I just feel like there's no reason to, you know, to treat people that way because at the end of the day, if we make people feel less alone and more seen then I just feel like, I don't know, there would be less isolation and yeah. feelings of wanting to leave this earth. <laughs> yeah. And I know that that was, I had some concern, like, you know, I, you know, I care about you very much and I, I want the best for you. And so whenever you, started saying all this i you know i i squirmed a little bit too i i'm you know yeah. human um and i was concerned about you know just if what it would do for your mental health journey and and so i i had some concern but then seeing the hundreds and hundreds of messages of people saying like thank you so much i you know i thought i was the only one that felt this way and knowing that so much suffering comes from isolation and there are many different types of isolation, not just physical isolation. There's, there's uh, isolation of feeling like you're the only one that feels a certain way yeah. and it makes you feel like you, something's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. But whenever you learn that not only this person on the internet, but the hundreds of people in the, in the comments feel the same way, you feel less alone. You feel like you're a little more part of a tribe. Yeah. A and I think that's incredibly important. I do too. It makes me, it makes me happy when people, you know, finally realize like they're not. I know I keep just saying it, but they're not the only one. It, it, there's something so powerful with having other people around you that feel similarly, that have um, emotions like you, that have stories like you. You know, we all have stories, but a lot of them kind of go hand in hand. It's it's like the quote, like pain is relative. You know, um, something about me speaking up on my podcast, I know that some of my future guests were worried. Well, I don't have a story about childhood trauma. I don't have a story about anyone that spit in my face, you know, I don't, I don't have that. It doesn't matter. Pain is relative mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be a painful story by any means because we all have different paths and we all have different journeys and we're going to connect with different people. And that's like the beauty of it to me. Yeah. yeah and that's a, your, your brain isn't connected to some database of all humans and they rank your trauma on the entire existence of humanity right it, you're it's your own it's the trauma that your brain knows the experiences that your brain knows that's where it it decides what spectrum uh your trauma is right you know, it's everything is relative to yourself and mm -hmm. that's what you have to realize that the things that you have gone through you know even if they you don't feel like they measure up on a grand scale in your brain, you know, these, these are very serious things. And so yeah. they need to be dealt with and you shouldn't feel uh, any certain way about bringing them up, no matter how insignificant you might perceive them to be. That's why your future episode where I interview you is going to be so powerful as well, because you've said that same thing to me. I wasn't abused as a kid. I had a great childhood, but you have things that happened in your life, which we'll get to talk about that, that, formed you and made you a certain way and at one point maybe you didn't like yourself and now you do because you realize other people go through the same thing mm -hmm. and it's 
pain is relative. It doesn't have to be a child getting, you know, physically abused or abused in any way to measure up to another child that had rejection in a different way. Sure. Like it's pain is relative. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Oh, and I, whenever you were talking about this earlier, this just annoys me so much whenever you're talking about putting new nurses in fight or flight and, yeah. and, uh, shame because they say like, well, you have to learn to work under pressure. You know, you have to work the, the, pressure, pressure? the pressure of shame and embarrassment is not the same as the pressure of urgency in a code situation. Quit doing that shit. That is old school. We're doing new nursing. Yeah. Cut it out. Cut it out. Leave the, Leave my babies alone. That's right. Mother. I am mother. <laughs> I think that's a great place to leave it. <laughs> A warning to all you mean nurses. Yeah, be nice. We're coming for you. Be nice. Awesome. Well, I hope you guys liked this episode. Sorry for all the... No, I'm not sorry for the tears. I'm not sorry for the tears. It's okay to cry. Yeah. It's a weird thing, though. You feel like you have to apologize, but I'm I'm a crier. You make me mad, happy, sad. I'm going to cry. So um, until next time, if you guys liked this episode, please let me know. Please send your feedback. Don't forget, this is the season we are finally dropping our juicy bits over on Patreon. There is some free extra content, and then you can pay for a little extra more. We're going to be doing more of the confessions and funny shit over there, along with some insightful educational things. So go check out the Patreon and listen to the juicy bits. But until next time. Yeah. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time.